our ICD-10 for radiology, pathology, and lab areas of healthcare. And uh, on our next slide, we'll see uh, when we talk about McKesson at a glance, one of the things is um, as America's oldest and largest healthcare services company, McKesson has been focusing on healthcare for over 180 years. Today, we rank 14th on Fortune's list of the nation's largest companies with over $122 billion in annual revenues. We employ more than 37,000 people throughout North America, Europe, and Asia. We distribute pharmaceuticals and medical supplies to retail pharmacies, hospitals, and health systems. We also provide software, automation, service, and consulting to hospitals, physician offices, imaging centers, home health care agencies, and payers. Nobody knows healthcare better than McKesson. From our unique vantage point across the entire healthcare system, we see changes and challenges, but we also see a path forward. Together with our customers and partners, we are creating a sustainable future for healthcare. Together we are charting a course to better health. McKesson business performance is the BPS and products. We have our ACO services. We have physician practice management services. We have our technology services and solutions. And then we have our consulting services. Uh, today, um, our speakers, um, I'm Cindy Kane uh, with McKesson, uh, one of the senior directors of physician services. We also will have Joe Fisher, who is a senior consult coding consultant. Uh, both of us combined together have over probably 40 plus years in healthcare, so we're very excited um, to be a part of the presentation today and to share you know, some of the information as we continue with our ICD-10 webinars. But on our agenda today, which we're pretty much following um, the same agenda if you've attended any of our past presentations because we wanted to make this still have an overview of some of the key components with ICD-10 in case someone is joining for the first time, but each has been a different specialty. So today we will be focusing on the radiology, pathology, and impact into some of the clinical laboratories. But we will again have a refresher course about the index, the conventions, the format, the structure. Some of the risk and challenges we're going to see that will impact radiologists, pathologists in our clinical laboratories, some documentation guidelines, and then some case examples and then some questions. And I would just like to encourage everyone, we will at the end of this presentation be uh, showing our next presentation that we will have, but it's very important to receive the feedback. Um, even you know, if some of that is in a positive format, if it's to where you have suggestions. Because as we continue, as we're getting closer and closer, we're almost, uh, you know, we're now, you know, I'm saying almost at the 12-month period. We've got about 14 months. But we want to make sure as we continue with our ICD-10 webinars that it's of uh, things that bring importance to you and some things that you would like to see. So we've had, um, you know, questions on our past webinars, but, you know, please, you know, questions or give us your feedback because that's how we can make sure that we're providing you with items that, you know, you feel are beneficial to you and to your group. But on our next slide, you know, what is the big deal when we, you know, we still hear that and I am amazed where I am still in a consulting role going into some practices. And when I just mentioned ICD-10, they're like, well, yes, you know, we're thinking about it. We're looking at that. But, you know, they still ask me what the big deal is. So uh, a little bit alarming when I hear that. But with our next slide, when we look at the key differences, you know, one of the things we want to, you know, note again is just the volume that's going to change between the ICD-9 volume 1 and 2 from the 13,000 codes, and then when we look at um, ICD-10 going into 68,000 codes, you know, that is just a huge amount of change. And then how is that going to be broken down by specialty? You know, the code format basically is going to change where our first digit will be alpha, and then if you've already looked at your draft ICD-10, if you've started doing any mapping of your I-9 codes to I-10 codes, then you can see that, you know, from your digits 2 through 7, they're numeric. We will not spend, you know, time about the PCS portion because that would be an entire, you know, workshop seminar 
by itself, but again, you can see the difference in the volume of going from 11,000 codes to 87,000. So again, you know, keep in mind that the ICD-9 Volume 3 and the ICD-10 PCS are for your hospital based only, but you know, the structural format and the volume differences is, you know, the key differences here between the two. Um, on our next slide, when we look at the index, you know, this is, you know, we want to remind everyone that once you have your three-digit alphanumeric code, then it guides you into that numeric tabular section that's in your ICD-10 book. So that is, you know, the purpose and how we would utilize the index. On the next slide, when we're looking at some of the documentation guidelines, some of the changes that will be within ICD-10, you know, we want to suggest that physicians and offices maybe start to run reports so that you determine the impact that the above changes based on your specialty will actually have to your practices. So you'll see, you know, we have greater clinical detail, uh, complications of care, combination codes. So these are just some of the, the key areas that as you run your specific individual specialty reports, you will be able to see, you know, of what areas will you have some of the greatest change and how that will impact in the documentation. When we talk about signs and symptoms, with the radiologist, the pathology, and with clinical labs, it will require more specific diagnosis codes. One of the things, um, if you think about in your offices today, if the lab has to send something back, whether that is in a phone call that comes to your office, whether it is something that comes by email, if it comes by fax, but if the radiologist, the pathologist, and the clinical labs are not having specific diagnosis codes, and one of the things, you know, that I, I do want to remind everyone when we're talking about the signs and symptoms is that, you know, it is, we do see that we have in our, you know, ICD-10 that we do have unspecified codes. But if you in your office today experience to where you're having a lot of follow-up with the radiologist, pathologist, and labs, you'll have to determine, you know, do you want to continue to use any of the unspecified codes, or do you want to try to see if you can use the more specific diagnosis codes? So again, you know, whether they're negative, whether they're normal, you know, those are the things that you want to make sure that you are, you know, staying on top of because it will require more specificity. So if we look, um, if we go, when we look again, you know, the structure and the format, I won't spend a lot of time on this because, you know, this again, is you know where we're seeing the different structural structural differences, and if you go to slide 13, you will see that notice we have our placeholder, and that will be the X. So hopefully most of you have started to do the crosswalk with your codes, and you're seeing that the reason for the X that will allow for the future expansion of those codes. So some examples is in the poisoning section, and under those categories in the T where there's adverse effects and underdosing codes, you'll see that that placeholder will exist because it's going to be there so that the code can be considered as a valid code because you still have to have your number of digits. The next slide gives an example. We've used this example in our previous uh, webinars. But as you can see, you know, we have the category, which would be the capital letter. Then we would go, the second digit would be numeric, third digit would be numeric. And then we would go back in, if we're looking at uh, an atomic site, severity, uh, etiology, the cause, it could be alpha or numeric. And then you can see that that would continue with the fifth or the sixth, and then the seventh as the extension can still be alpha or numeric. So you know, in this example, we're looking at unspecified fracture, the lower end of the left radius. It is an initial encounter for a closed fracture. So again, this gives you that example of how it goes alpha to numeric. Um, one of the things on the next slide that you want to remember also is there will be additional details in the laterality and in the extension codes. So again, you know, what additional details will the ICD-10 code provide? It will give in the extension, that would be your codes if it's the initial encounter, if it's a follow-up, if it's a SQL visit, if it's aftercare, 
and then the laterality can be the right or the left depending on the code that you're looking at. Some of the similarities that you will see when you're doing some of your crosswalks will be that and can mean and or or. Uh, you may see that the NEC and the NOS are used the same. The code conventions for the include notes in the exclusion terms will stay unchanged. But you will see that there will be some similarities. But again, you know, I want to encourage you to look at the detail, look at the actual documentation of the code, and then make sure, you know, what are similarities? Because this will be important as you're working with your providers if they're having to change their documentation habits or if they're already coding correctly, they may not have, you know, those areas that they would have to, to look at that, mu that much. Some of the benefits of ICD-10, many physicians ask this every day, you know, it's more work, it's going to take longer, we're having our training, we're having to go through all the changes, but what will be the benefits? You know, here is a list of what some of the major benefits are, but one of the main things that I think everyone is, is really concerned with, with the increase of audits that we've had over the last few years, a key area of the benefit of ICD-10 is it will prevent and detect the healthcare fraud and abuse. So that's going to be one of the key areas. You know, if you're receiving letters from payers, uh, if you've um, had opportunity, you've had to be involved or participated in a RAC audit, once we do move to ICD-10 and the coding is reflecting the appropriate ICD-10 codes, it, we should start to see that it will prevent and allow us to detect, you know, the healthcare fraud and abuse. So hopefully we do see a decrease in some of those, those audits. Uh, some of the, the new features that will be in ICD-10 is, as I had mentioned before, laterality, the left, right, bilateral. So you can see some examples here that we have listed as to where, you know, that will be a new feature. You're going to have some of the combination codes for certain conditions and common associated symptoms and manifestations. Uh, these are listed here, uh, the diverticulitis, the type 2 diabetes. And then you'll have some in your combination codes when we talk about poisons and their associated external cause. Um, so again, we have an example there. So you can see with that one we have a placeholder because again, that has to make that a valid, a valid code. Uh, we're going to have a poll question that will that will pop up now. You know, please participate um, in the poll question. Uh, we'll give a couple of seconds for everyone to answer that. Okay. So then we, you know, we move and we talk about, you know, we have our training and who does that encompass. But one of the big deals will be with the physiology and anatomy. And if you have um, certified coders, and you know, I would encourage again that you may want to take refresher courses in anatomy because again, based on your slide, you know, if we're looking at the next slide and we're seeing, you know, the ICD-10 has that greater need for coders to understand the human, human anatomy. If you, in your specialty with orthopedics, um, cardiology, many of the codes, if you've started to look at your top I-9 codes and how they map to the I-10 code, you will start to see that that anatomy and understanding that plays a huge part into the appropriate code. And also, if you're doing some internal audits with your physicians to see how they're coding today, would it support the IT code, you may go ahead and be able to show them where they're going to have to improve on their documentation. So again, you know, you may want to determine in your practices, your offices, who may need to take some refresher courses within the anatomy. And now I'm going to turn um, the, this part of the presentation over to Joe Fisher, and he's going to go over uh, the impact that I-10 will have on radiology. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Continuing on slide 22, the impact to the radiologists, the jump from 13,000 codes in ICD-9 to 68,000 codes in ICD-10 is resulting from a greater amount of information that's required about the acuity of the patient and correlating disease process, 
radiologists need to be aware of what is expected so that it can be incorporated into, into their interpretive report and the patient's medical record. For example, fractures will have five classifications rather than just open or closed. Other information besides open or closed to include when documenting a fracture are the anatomical site, the laterality, the fracture type, whether the fracture is displaced or non-displaced, and whether it's the initial or subsequent encounter. Also, if the encounter is subsequent, the reason why, for example, delayed healing, non-union or malunion, as well as how it happened. This level of detail will also need to be reported with other sections. On page, on, sorry, on slide 23, <clears throat> excuse me, radiologists and their practice managers need to work together with referring physicians so they can provide the needed detailed documentation to translate to the most specific I-10 code. Radiologists should develop a plan to contact their high volume referring physicians and begin to work extensively with them to prepare for I-10. Referring physicians will need to supply the radiologists with specific and detailed orders so that they can make use of the new I-10 codes and descriptions as well as supplying enough documentation for the imaging tests to be pre-certified. Failure of the referring physicians to supply this information may cause delayed or lost reimbursement to the radiologist and also create extra work for both of the offices. On slide 24, we have the ICD-9 code and corresponding I-10 code for femur neck closed fracture unspecified. Although it would seem inherent, this would be the initial counter for the femur neck fracture, Current coding in I-9 doesn't necessitate the inclusion of this information. So for coding the fractures, the A in the I-10 code is the indicator of the episode of care, with A indicating it's the initial encounter. In order to assign a complete and valid I-10 code, the radiologist must document the episode of care. In slide 25, Although I-10 does allow for the reporting of unspecified codes for limb pain, when dictating your reports, it will become much more important to identify the actual limb, be it right or left, and the specific location, be it the upper arm, forearm, wrist, or hand. As mentioned in previous webinars, webinars insurance carriers may eventually frown on these unspecified codes and they may request more specific information before paying a claim. So the goal, I believe, with I-10 is to use the specificity that the codes allow. Providers who currently have good documentation habits will find the transition to I-10 easier than those who don't. Therefore, now is the time to ready yourself. On slide 26 are the I-10 subcategories applicable to limb pain. The code range of M79.60 through M79676 includes 38 codes. And depending on your code choice, and depending on your code will depend on the specified site. The steps for locating the correct I-10 code is the same as in I-9. On slide 27, for example, we have postmenopausal osteoporosis of current pathological fracture vertebra initial encounter. You're going to locate the term osteoporosis in the alpha index, move down the listing to find postmenopausal, and then further down to find with pathological fracture of the vertebra, and you'll arrive at code M80.08. Continuing on page on slide 29, you'll verify that code in the tabular list of the I-10 manual, age-related osteoporosis with current pathological fracture vertebra. There, you'll see a symbol next to the code indicating that this code will require a seventh digit following the placeholder. Therefore, the correct and complete code for this diagnosis is M80.08XA. The seventh character A, indicating the initial encounter, is used while the patient is receiving active treatment for the condition. 
For example, surgical treatment, emergency department encounter, or an evaluation and treatment by a new physician. The seventh character, D, indicates a subsequent encounter and is used after the patient has received active treatment of the condition and is receiving routine care for the condition during the healing or recovery phase. For example, cast change or removal, removal of external or internal fixation device, or medication adjustments. And then the seventh character of S indicates sequela, and that's used for complications or conditions that arise as a direct result of the condition, such as a scar formation after a burn. Everyone will face challenges with I-10, as noted on slide 29. So now is the time for radiology practices to implement clinical documentation improvements. This will provide more detailed patient medical records and allow time for the coders to work with that additional information. Delaying documentation improvements to the last minute may result in more provider inquiries by the coders, increased delays in authorizations, an increase in claim rejections, and the need for more time to resolve reimbursement issues. Now is also the time to ensure that you're receiving good and strong clinical information from other areas of the hospital and referring physicians. At this point, I believe we have another poll question for you guys to answer, and then Cindy will continue with the presentation. Cindy, are you ready to continue here? Okay, I think we're having a little technical difficulty with getting Cindy unmuted. So bear with us for a second, please. Okay, while we're trying to resolve some of these issues. Uh, Joe, can oh, you hear me now? Perfect timing, Cindy. There okay. you go. Okay, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, to continue with pathology, as uh, what Joe was referencing in radiology, there's going to be a wide range of diagnoses that will cause referring physicians to order the laboratory test, and then this will translate into the big impact for pathologists. How well you document for your ICD-10-CM will determine whether or not you get paid. So in general, a physician's documentation for ICD-10 will need to be more specific and detailed than is required for the current ICD-9. So this may mean that you have to capture new information about the patient's condition that the pathologist never documented before, or updating, modifying, and expanding his or her documentation. Physicians that currently have good documentation habits will find the transition much easier than those who may be using abbreviations or other shortcuts. So for the pathologist, capturing that more detailed diagnosis information from the referring physician orders will be a particular challenge. Um, as Joe had referenced, referenced with radiology, you know, if you go ahead and look at any of the challenges you're having today, you know, and try to work with those individuals so that you develop a plan so that you know you're not having to spend that extra time on the phone pulling information you know going back and forth. If we look at slide 32, um, this is just a reminder of some of the examples and how the code and descriptors will now look different. So you know this is the carcinoma um, of the breast, we can see that under the I9, the 233.0, and then we go into our D category. So overall, if we're looking in chapter where it says the D, and we start with the carcinoma, 
we will see that we have over 16 possible codes and then listed below are those examples. So again, it's going to be you know, very important to know the detail of that. When we look at slide 33 and we're looking at some of the laterality examples, you can see Again, you know, if we look at code C50.511, this would be the malignant neoplasm of the lower outer quadrant of the right female breast. If we look at code 512, it would be on the left. And then if we see uh, our code C50.519, that is the malignant neoplasm of the lower outer quadrant of unspecified female breast. So again, when we talk about unspecified codes, you will see that they are there. There are still some of the unspecified. But again, you know, the payers are allowing those for now, but we don't want to do training and then have to go back and say, you know, now we've got to retrain. So if there are um, specific scenarios that you can use the most specified and you do have that information, that would be what you would want to use. On slide 34, we have a case example. This would be another example of a colon incomplete. So this is where we've had our colonoscopy uh, by the hot biopsy technique. We can see that we would have our indications in our report. So it would see a screening, probably diverticulitis. We would see the medications here. It would say the mag per anesthesia. Then we would have the description of our procedure. And then we would have if there were complications. We would have the impression in the report. And then we would have pathology that would be pending results. If we go to slide 35, we're seeing here under our ICD-10 codes, the example above is that the patient had presenting for a screening colonoscopy to determine if the patient did have diverticulitis. Because the main reason for the procedure is a screening, the appropriate primary code would be Z13.811. This would be the encounter for screening of the lower gastrointestinal disorder. We next need to report the abnormal findings from the procedure. And in this case, it was the patient's polyp and the diverticulitis. So you could see that we would then go um, to section where we would have our rectal polyp, K62.1. And then we would have the diverticulitis of the large intestine without perforation or abscess without bleeding. So in the scenario, this rationale would be that under ICD-10, the documentation of codes for screenings must include any of the abnormal findings. So then if the abnormal finding is found, that would be listed secondary to the screening. So the screening codes in ICD-10 can be broken down either by the condition, the anatomic location, depending on the type of screening, or the actual procedure. So you can see, see the flow in the step process of just where you know, you're going in for that normal encounter. This would be a normal type pathology report, but how you would drill down and how the codes do change in that example. Under, on slide 36, under the ICD-10 index integral list are similar to our I-9, but, it's, but you know, under our I-10 codes, it is much longer. So you do have the categories, the subcategories, and then the codes are contained within the tabular list. So you would again go through each one of those and finding each of the appropriate codes, realizing that the I-10 is much longer and it will take a little bit more time when you're identifying that code. On slide 37, we have kind of some common case examples that pathology uh, see. I had reached out to some of our pathology groups and said, you know, what are just some of your basic examples that you see over and over? You know, one of the ones was the colon polyp. The clinical is the colon cancer screening. The final diagnosis may be transverse colon polyp with an excision. You may have that there was no evidence of high-grade dysplasia. So the process, again, is you would go into the index. You would see the neoplasm benign by the site. Then you want to index your neoplasm table. So then you're going to go to the intestine, the large colon, transverse. And then you finally come to the determination of your ICD-10 code of D12.3 for a benign neoplasm of the transverse colon. Um, the process that a pathology coder would follow would be going through this process. So another example, if we're looking at 
uh, when we're going through the colon polyp and we see colon cancer screening. So the patient would have had colon cancer. This is a screening. Are they are screening for colon cancer? So you would again have a final diagnosis code of the colon polyp excision. This was benign, but it showed uh, the mucus showing the changes consistent with hyperplastic polyp. So again, you have to go into your index, you go to the polyp section, you go to the colon, and then you, we would actually just see that this was a polyp because it was benign. So this appropriate code under I-10 would be K63.5. When we talk about the neoplasms uh, on slide 39, if you go in your ICD-10 book, the Chapter 2, it contains codes for most of the benign and malignant neoplasms. And to properly code your neoplasms, you have to look at the documentation in the medical record because it must indicate if the neoplasm is benign, in situ, malignant, or of uncertain histologic behavior. If there is a malignancy, the secondary mystatic site should also be reported. In I-9, there's the separate table of neoplasms, and the codes are selected from the table. But however, when you look into the guidelines for ICD-10, it actually states that if the histology cell type of the neoplasm is documented, that term should be referenced first. So you would go to the main section of the index to the diseases rather than going immediately to your neoplasm table in order to determine which column and the neoplasm table is appropriate. So this is a little bit different. Um, I know for myself, as I have started to do I-10 coding, when looking at uh, scenarios in cases like this, under the histology, and you're looking at the cell type, and you're having to go into the index of the diseases, that is a little bit new, it's different, and it does take a little bit more time. So again, Looking at the report, understanding that process, instead of going immediately to the neoplasm table, you can actually pull some of your maybe most common scenarios that you're seeing today, and then when you go to code those into I-10, see the difference of where you're having to go to identify that appropriate within the neoplasms. So it is a little bit more detailed. There is the specificity there. Um, learning to look in the table is also in the disease index. And then the time that that will involve as the coders continue when you're looking at the neoplasms. Um, some of the changes in the neoplasm table on slide 40 is, you know, the neoplasms in their own category, not with malignant in the in situ, the code descriptions. Uh, you'll see that it will say without mention of remission for multiple myeloma, malignant plasms, cell neoplasms, leukemia. Um, you'll see that some have changed and expanded to where it will have not have an achieved remission, in remission, and in relapse. So again, very important for someone that is um, dealing with something that is a malignancy to know is it in remission, relapse, They've not achieved remission. So again, you know, you're having to look at that within the documentation. Uh, with the laterality, as we had discussed, in the neoplasms of the breast, there's the right and the left. So we have to remember um, you know, to have that with our specific documentation. On slide 41, this just actually shows you um, an example of the number of neoplasms that go from section C OO all the way to D49. So it is a large number that, you know, as a coder, when you're just dealing with the malignant neoplasms of where you would go and the detail that you would be cross-referenced in the documentation, the pathology report is then to assign that appropriate code within ICD-10. On slide 42, this just gives another example, a reminder of how the code and descriptors will look. So you will see again the specificity, uh, how they do change, and how that wording uh, is a little bit longer than what you're currently seeing today within the ICD-9. On slide 43, we have an uh, example where this is where a female patient presented with an endocarcinoma of the right breast, the lower outer quadrant of the left side. So the physician's documentation indicates the primary side. The index to diseases should be reviewed prior to referencing the neoplasm table. 
And the first step is to reference the index to diseases. So if we look at the adenocarcinoma M8140, we see the neoplasm has malignant. The index to the diseases identifies the carcinoma as a malignancy reported by the site. So this would be where the coder would reference the neoplasm table for the selection of the correct code. On slide 44, it, um, also the table will provide proper coding based on the histology of the neoplasm by the site. You will then go to the tabular index. That should be referenced to verify the correct code has been selected. Or if there's a more specific code that does not exist. So if you're looking at the table, uh, that is actually within the book. It's also on the CMS website. So one of the things the correct diagnosis code, if we were looking at this example, would be our C50.52. This was the adenocarcinoma of the left side, the lower quadrant, outer quadrant, and malignant primary side. So that would drill you down into that reference and finding that correct code. On slide 45, when we look at pathology reports, you know, one of the things is you don't code a malignancy without a pathology report confirm, confirming the histology. A note for the attending physicians, you know, would be that you must document the diagnosis code if there's not a path report in the record. You don't need a path report for chemotherapy and radiation encounters. But again, you know, one of the key things, you know, a takeaway here would be make sure before we're assigning the malignancy, you know, we do have a report. But if there's not a report, the attending physician must still document the diagnosis of what would be in the record appropriately. On slide 46, when we look at our clinical laboratories, clinical laboratories encompass everything because you have to realize, you know, of every specialty that's in healthcare, physicians for whatever test are sending the patients to the clinical laboratories with their labs. So one of the things, you know, as we want to, as we go, you know, to this, is we want to talk about that impact and the volume that will be coming in, you know, to the, the clinical laboratories. I believe we're going to have a poll question at this time, so we will, if you'll take a moment and just answer the poll question, please. Okay, so talking about the impact, you know, although the changes to ICD-10 will have many new elements, one thing that will not change is the fact that the labs will be completely, you know, 100% dependent on physicians to provide the accurate diagnosis code on their test orders, a unique but not new dilemma among our healthcare providers. Under Medicare, the electronic reimbursement claims for lab tests must obtain the valid and specific diagnosis code that explains the reason the test was performed. The proper diagnosis codes are especially important in cases where Medicare establishes a national coverage determination, your NCD, or your local coverage determination, your LCD, that limits reimbursement to only certain situations. Unlike the atomic pathology, radiology, and other diagnostic providers, the clinical labs may not code their own claims, nor can they fill in the blanks without consulting the ordering physician. So as Joe had referenced in radiology, you know, if you have your front desk person that answers the phone and you're a high volume office, and now you have the additional phone calls coming in because I'm standing in the lab and they're saying they do not have an appropriate diagnosis code. So it's going to be the time that would be from whomever answers the phone, if it goes back to the clinical person that may be in the room with the patient, if the clinical person cannot make a determination, it's back to the physician, it's back looking at the documentation. So you can see the domino effect, the backlog that will happen when they're having to wait because the labs cannot fill in the blank. 
Um, this will be the single greatest challenge that labs will face in handling a new, more complicated universe of diagnosis codes. You know, if we have attendees today that are on the webinar that work in the clinical laboratories, and you realize, you know, your physicians or your offices or your facilities that you currently have issues with, you know, you may want to have a process that you're already working with them and saying, you know, we have to eliminate part of this because we do have to have that information. Uh, labs already spend a tremendous amount of time working with physicians on the use of ICD-10 codes for limited coverage tests. And to this day, they still have a fairly high percentage of diagnoses that are not coded to the highest level of specificity. And this was actually released in a recent article from the AACC, which is the American Association for Clinical Chemistry. Um, the Office of Inspector General has made it clear that the clinical laboratories are expressly prohibited from rendering or suggesting diagnosis codes if they are not supplied by the ordering provider. So lab techs will want to start to be aware of how some of the nuances of the actual coding could affect their operations. I'm going to now turn it back over to Joe, and he's going to go over some additional case examples uh, that we have reviewed in some of our previous uh, webinars, but we feel that there's some of the very most common ones that you'll see, so we just wanted to do a refresher course on those. Great. Thank you, Cindy. On slide 49, we have a primary care preventive diagnosis case example. 22-year-old female is seen for a preventative visit. She's doing well and has no complaints. She'll have her normal immunizations and return as needed until her next scheduled preventative service. Again, the process for coding this is starting in your alpha index, locating the terms examination adult. Then you'll verify in the tabular list, the code Z00.00, encounter for general adult medical exam without abnormal findings, and that would be your correct code. Another example on slide 50 illustrates the need for detailed documentation. In I-9 for depression, we have the go-to code of 311. However, in I-10, you're going to need to document if the depression is a single episode or if it's recurrent. Then you'll have choices. Is it moderate? I'm sorry, mild, moderate, or severe. And if it is severe, is it with or without psychotic features? And finally, is it in remission? If so, is it partial remission or full remission? I think this is a great example of the specificity that the I-10 codes will allow you to give. On slide 52, HIPAA 837 rule notes that four diagnosis codes can be reported per line item. As noted earlier, nonspecific or unspecified codes are still included in the I-10 when the documentation supports their use. However, it's always the best practice to code as specific as possible. Because of the time, expense, and resources committed to the implementation of I-10, payers may eventually frown on some of these unspecified codes and update their LCDs accordingly. For example, there is an I-10 code for a radius fracture, unspecified part, unspecified arm. However, a radiologist should be able to identify and document which arm, left or right, has the radius fracture. Also, which part of the radius, be it distal, shaft, or proximal, has the fracture. There are steps that coders can take now to be ready for the October 1st, 2014 implementation date. Take your most common diagnosis that you use now and see if your documentation supports a valid and specific I-10 code. This will help determine where your training needs. Also find legitimate resources specific to your specialty to assist you. There are a number of specialty society websites that can be used for I-10 information. Also, you want to learn about the I-9 to I-10 crosswalks and then the I-10 to I-9 crosswalks. But also note that they're not, there won't always be a one-to-one -one transition. Because if you remember in our previous 
slide the radius fracture example and what additional information was needed for a specific I-10 code assignment. Also, coders may need to brush up on their anatomy and physiology, as Cindy alluded to earlier. And what I believe is the most valuable tip, have a good communication with your providers. It's their documentation, and you should be able to work with them as a team. On slide 54, steps providers can take now to be ready for I-10. Work closely with other providers regarding the documentation changes needed for accurate and specific I-10 coding. Continue medical necessity documentation in the medical records. Evaluate your electronic health record for any documentation changes needed to transition from I-9 to I-10. And as coders need to work hand-in-hand -hand with their providers, the providers also need to work closely with their coders to ensure appropriate and sufficient documentation needed for accurate and specific I-10 code assignment. Providers and coders should take advantage of ongoing educational training and webinars. There are many resources out there to help you with a smooth transition to I-10, including CMS and other payer websites. Everyone has a different learning level and I recommend that you take advantage of all the resources that you need. Remember, I-10 is affecting everyone. Don't hesitate to ask questions or network with others. Most important, work together as a team to achieve the best outcome. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole to cover the remaining two slides. Um, okay. Uh I think we've had a, a little bit of some te technical difficulties, but this okay. is Cindy. And on our next slide, thank you, Joe. Uh, on slide 56, we wanted to announce the upcoming ICD-10 CM, CM webinar. And actually, we had um, felt that as we go through the process and we were saying the final 12 months, we are very excited um, to be sponsored by HFMA, and the next webinar will be Assessing the Productivity and Financial Impact of ICD-10, the final 12 months. So, you know, where are you? Uh, what do you need to be doing? How this financial impact will come into your practice, your facility? So again, this will be on October the 15th at 2 o'clock Central Time, and uh, you can register at McKessonCanHelp.com, so that is the link. So uh, we're very excited about that and hope that everyone will be able to register and attend uh, that as well. And on our next slide, if you have not, if you've attended some of our previous webinars and if you have not taken the short AAPC CEU test, it is available for the attendees. You will receive one CEU. Uh, you will be sent an email concluding the webinar with the link. And so that will provide you to where you can uh, get that one CEU. And at this time, um, if we have questions, uh, we would welcome any questions that you may have. Hi, Cindy and Joe. We have our first question. How do we plan a budget for ICD-10? Where do we begin? OK. Um, I'll start, and I will let Joe um, also contribute to this. You need to look at, you need to do, I would suggest doing an ICD-10 operational assessment to where that allows you to go through your practice and determine who will be impacted, what would be, who would need to be trained, what type of training. Uh, you also need to look at your systems, your vendors, if they're going to have to be updated, speak to your vendors. And it's really going through um, your office determining, you know, what area will be impacted and then start that's a starting point and then you have to start to put you know the numbers to that to say you know what do you currently have for education what do you currently do for updates and that would then kind of show you the amount of a dollar figure from a financial impact of what you would need to at least start with within your budget okay thank you does it matter if the placeholder is a capital X or lowercase x? Is it case sensitive? I don't believe it's case sensitive. All, all the documentation that I've seen was a lowercase. Correct. 
Thank you. For physician documentation training, what would your suggested next steps be? Well, I think a good place to start, and I think either myself or Cindy referenced this earlier in the slides, is to start now with your top diagnoses, so your top 50 or so, and see, see if your documentation right now, before any changes or any training is initiated, can you get to a detailed, complete I-10 code? If not, that will give you an indication of where you need to start your training and, and what steps you need to take to get the documentation up to par. Correct. And uh, just to add to, to Joe's um, suggestions would be if you are utilizing an electronic health record, is by following those steps that uh, Joe was referencing, it will allow you to also look at your templates in case you need to do any updates to your existing templates. Great, thank you. We did have a couple questions about uh, the recording of this webinar. We did record the webinar. We will be emailing a link of the recorded webinar and the slides out following this webinar. We'll also put it on our website. Uh, we did have a couple questions about the poll results. The first poll about uh, practices being prepared for ICD-10, 47% were somewhat prepared, 27% were not prepared, 12% were prepared. As far as budget goes, 23% do have a specific budget for ICD-10, 77% do not at this time, and the biggest challenge with ICD-10 was educating physicians about improved documentation. So it looks like those are all our questions for today. We will be emailing the presentation out this afternoon so you can have links to CEU credits as well as um, the McKessonCanHelp.com website, which will have our next October ICD-10 webinar on it. So thank you for joining us today, and have a great day.